All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to a very special episode of the London is Blue podcast. Uh, of course, you know that I am Nick, but Brandon and Dan both working this morning. Uh, I am joined, however, by the uh, incredible Pat Nevin, someone who, if you've listened to the show for a while, you've heard many a time on the show. Uh, we call him Professor Pat because he typically surprises us with all sorts of great knowledge and insights. And uh, Pat, grateful to have you back on the show. How are you doing? Absolutely. Brilliant to be back on the show. Um, I'm doing absolutely well. Uh, I'm in Scotland. It's nearly Christmas and it's not freezing. What is going on? <laughs> Whoa. You're, you're just in a light jacket. I don't know what's happening. I know. I've been out for a run and everything this morning. So uh, this is weird. We're usually up to our knees in snow by this point in time, but uh, we're okay <laughs> at the moment. We're all right. Getting ready for the holidays? Um. Well, because of my job, we don't really get much of a holiday, to be honest. Um, I've got a whole bunch of games coming up. Uh, I've got a, I'm doing a Newcastle game uh, on the day after Christmas, Boxing Day, we call it. Um, then uh, we've got, I've got Celtic versus Rangers, which will be mad. Whoa. <laughs> which it's always mad, but it's particularly mad at the moment. And a whole bunch of other things going on. So it's uh, no, good times, but lovely time with the family as well. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, just a quick call to action. Obviously, uh, you guys are the reason why this community exists. If you are uh, hoping to support the podcast, there are a few free ways you can do that, of course, through five-star reviews and subscribing on YouTube, all those sorts of good things. If you do want to join our very excellent Discord, you can, of course, do that. Um, we, are, we are just on Discord now, not through Patreon. So just Google London is Blue Discord, and, and we'll get you all set up there. And we have tons and tons of episodes during the festive period. You know that. So uh, just pick a day. There's going to be a new pod and, and we're going to be on it. So uh, look, if you have any questions, uh, email us, contact at London is Blue Podcast, DM us. It's all good. We're, uh, we're here. So let's let's dive in, Pat. We, you know, I think it's been a year or so maybe since you were last on. I think maybe just about this time last year. A lot's happened, right? You know, there's there's been... Uh, a takeover by Clear Lake of the club. There's, you know, been a, a pretty horrific league season uh, for Chelsea and in, in both starts of the seasons anyway. Uh, you're no longer working for the club in an official capacity, and you've released a whole other book during this time. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how do you sum up the last year of, of all things Chelsea? It's been been pretty wild. It's been a bit, um, yeah, it's been a bit worse. I have to add something else on the top of that, which is uh, I got an, a new job working for the BBC doing a newsletter, which is aimed mostly at America on the BBC website, uh, but also in other countries around the world. It's big in Nigeria and various places like that. So, you know, kind of football and the kind of media, is, it's, it's always moving. It's always changing. Um, but Chelsea, we know what Chelsea's like. If, if you've followed Chelsea for 20, 25, 30 years, you'll know Mad things happen. It's never, ever dull. It's always changing. It's always extreme. Remember that period under Roman where we seemed to be changing managers every 20 minutes, all that sort of stuff. But we kept on bringing in the trophies. Um, but the change, this change now for the new ownership, Clear Lake, et cetera, um, that's, that's probably bigger than anything that, that I've seen at the club uh, over the years since Roman Abramovich took over. And it's not just a change of ownership, it's a massive change in direction, a massive different outlook. Um, it's, it's it's interesting. It's had a tough start, I have to say. Mm -hmm. I think we all have to admit it's been a very tough start. Um, certainly, uh, clearly, they've put their money where their mouths are, and there's a lot of money being spent um, to try and build up what will be a future for the club. When it started, and a lot of people saw the money being thrown at the the actual team and the squad, there was a lot of negativity around the UK. I have to say, I was one of the very few that was saying, I get this. I see what they're trying to do here. Because if you're going to try and spend dollar for dollar with the likes of, you know, you know, United Arab Emirates or Qatar or whatever, it's going to be tough, right? It's going to yeah. be really, really tough. So you need to think of another plan. And the plan looked to me quite obvious very quickly. You go around the world and you try and get the best of the youth that you possibly can. And you get that as early as you can, preferably cheap, although that wasn't managed. Um, and then over a period, you grow that. And hopefully, you know, two, three years down the line, you have a team that's, you know, able to be you know, at least competitive at the top end of the Premier League and back in Europe again. 
So I can, I have to say, I thought it looked pretty clear what was happening. Um, it's, it's also a massive experiment. It's also a gigantic set of chances to take because footballs, they're, they're kind of not like normal assets. They don't change the way you expect them to. And they're human beings. So if you do give someone an eight-year contract, for some people that will make you feel great, relaxed, comfortable. You will grow into yourself. For other people, it will be, give me that cigar. <laughs> yeah. And you need to know the personalities. And you need to, And the other thing is recruitment. It's making sure that you know the best players at 18, 19 might not be the best players at 25. It doesn't work that way. And a classic example of it, you can look at the data, a few years back, remember, I talked to somebody about the, the data, and, and Chelsea obviously used data very, very strongly at the moment. And the best player in the world was chased by data, and uh, Manchester United got him, and they bought Paul Pogba for a world record amount. And four years later, they got rid of him for nothing. That's the problem. Data tells you about the, the past, not the future. <laughs> and that is... So you need Wenger, to get these... Arsene Wenger said that, right? Like, about players, like, it's it's... You have to have some intuition with it as well. Yeah, intuition, knowledge, read the right data because everyone's using it. Every, I mean, everyone is. I have to say Spurs used it really well. Liverpool used it incredibly well with a lot of their players a few years back. So everyone's using it. This is not new science. You know, this is what everyone uses. It's using it the right way. And uh, I mean, I keep on underlining to people, you just don't know yet with Chelsea. It's far too early to tell. Uh, and I, I, as I say, I, at the start, people were saying, oh, will you get your Champions League football this year? And I went, no, not with a bunch of people that are very young, that don't actually know the league, that have just been thrown together. Well, why would you? Why do you expect that? You know, and people, so, some Chelsea fans may have thought I was being negative, maybe even the club may have thought <laughs> But in reality, that's just reality. And I can't, I have to speak as to you know the truth you know many of my jobs are and I, I need to be honest you know i work for bbc i can't muck around it tell you what i see and also it's a bit of an insight having been an executive chief executive at a club myself i understand that these things are they're not magic but you know they're not as simple and there's not as pure as they look from the outside and it does look sometimes you know simple from the outside it's not it's a really tough thing to get right and uh some of those players will get right, some will get wrong. Some of the ones we lost, I was disappointed with, as were many Chelsea fans. Um, but then, you know, that's the plan in place. And you will not know if it's good, bad or indifferent until at least another season, at least another season after this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an incredible uh, soliloquy to start. I mean, I think we're all kind of feeling the uncertainty of it all right now. We're... It, you, I think you're hundred percent right. Like it, if you take bigger gambles, you won't know if they pay off until they inevitably do or don't. Right. This is a, it's kind of the, the whole point of the gamble uh, is to not go with the sure thing. Um, so we will catch up on Chelsea here in a second. Uh, but I think where I want to start because uh, you know, we've, we've talked through uh, your writing process before is your new book. Um, this is the sequel uh, to the accidental footballer, this football and how to survive it. Uh, I I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is kind of the part two, like maybe in the in the series. Um, the the synopsis on Amazon is great. So you fell into football by accident. You play for Chelsea, Everton, in your country at an international level. But what happens when you discover you're in so deep that football has taken over your whole life? That's a pretty damn good uh, opening <laughs> statement there, Pat. <laughs> exactly. Um, and because I said, and the, the dichotomy I was, of course, at the core of it is I love playing football. I absolutely love it. I don't know if anyone enjoyed the actual process of actually kicking the ball and playing the game and the creativity more than I did. Um, but also didn't want it to be completely and utterly controlling of your whole life because you only get one life. And I know lots of people want to be completely involved in the game all the time. But, you know, um, I've got other things I'm interested in, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mentioned soliloquies there. I quite like Shakespeare. So, um, you know, there's other things you want to do as well. But I was, at that point, really in very, very deep. And this book, The Football and How to Survive It, I, mean, I was really quite pleased with the title because it is survival, you know, as in not desperately trying to stay in the game. 
but desperately trying to stay sane in the game when the madness that surrounded it because you know without giving too much away you know I had four years with a team called Tramier Rovers we were knocking on the Premier League every single season you know and I was playing the best football in my career and I was still playing international in Scotland and you know so that I mean that was great exciting times and then near the end of my career back up to Scotland had a year a brilliant year there I was doing other things. I was PFA chairman, you know, so there was other adventures around that and other things that I was doing. But then the second half of this book is when it gets completely and utterly mad, absolutely wild, because uh, a friend of mine who knows nothing about football buys a football club, a top level football club in Scotland. And I kind of didn't know them, him that well, but I liked his attitudes towards business. And he asked me if I could run the company for him. And uh, certainly, being in the inside, now I'd been in the inside as PFA chairman, so I was on all the all the different boards that you get in the Premier League, etc. I'd, I'd done all that stuff in England, but up in Scotland now you're an executive and you're running a club and you tr- know a great deal about the background of it and you're trying to shove them in a certain way and weird things start happening and the money gets a bit strange as well. Um, and my back, I've got another background. Partly, I did a degree in economics and accounts, business studies. So I've got the background to do it right. Um, but a lot of the time, and the funniest bit that was uh, I sent in the final synopsis of, I was not the final, the first draft to the publishers, and they read through it and they went, "You're making that up. That couldn't have happened." <laughs> Surely, <laughs> mad things like uh, I remember we we think you think imagine we're the a top team, top division in Scotland, right? And I'm practicing my own my own in the pitch one day. And I think, this is really weird. There's something wrong here. I, d- I don't understand what it is, but something wrong about the free kicks I'm flying in at the top corner. Turns out we had a 16-yard line, not an 18-yard line. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it would come back to bite me, because, and it probably was their yonks before I was there. And there's weird little things like that that would happen. And then there's trying to structure and run a future of a football club. And it's very similar wherever you go. I mean, one of the things I did say, you know, I was chief executive, but I was also playing. And how mental is that? <laughs> Get your head around that one. So it was me playing. My man, my boss is the manager. I'm his boss as well. <laughs> it's <laughs> really confusing. <laughs> But because we had a good relationship, it worked well. And the players seemed to get on okay with me. And I always made it clear, look, if you don't want me there, I'll just say, I'll walk away. And I'll just do the chief exec role. And they, I, I stayed for two years playing, you know, and they were, they were fine with it, apart from one difficult moment. Um, but they're all covered in the book. But all those complications. But one of the difficult things I talk about in the book, without going into, again, too much detail. Can was, you give it all away, Pat? Come on. I know. Pl- trust me, there's plenty in there. <laughs> <laughs> Lots in there. Why a chairman should rarely, if ever, go into a dressing room. <laughs> now, I was a chief executive, which was different, but a chair is basically ownership. And I explained all that. And then Chelsea, Chelsea was bought over by Claire. <laughs> and, and then this was after I'd written it, and Todd apparently went into the dressing room. Now I'm going, oh, that's going to look really oh, good on no. me. <laughs> oh, no. But I, I can't back down because there's reasons why. That's a dangerous and difficult thing to do. Um, so I was, I was all sorts of stuff. And I, I loved writing it, but there's depth as well. It's not just football. You know, I, things that I had to deal with in my life are, you know, my son we found was autistic. And the, 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 def, the difficulties that places in life and the changes that makes yeah. to your life as well. So the amount of people that, um, this is a classic one, people that come up to me and say, you know, this book, this second book's better than the first one, Pat. And I'm thinking, I'm actually quite offended by that. I quite like the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's meant as a compliment. So as you can tell, keep myself busy. Um, but it was a it was an absolute pleasure writing and remembering it all because the one big thing about football and inside this business, you never look back. You can't. It's like a terrible guilty pleasure to look back. Because if you win one game, you don't say always oh, great last week. No, no, you're thinking about the next game. And you it's almost indoctrinated, you know, into your psyche and you're not allowed to change. So it probably took me 20 years to get my head around. Okay, I can look back now. And to be honest, I actually enjoyed it when I did it. 
Well, we're going to take a quick ad break, and then I have about 10 more questions about this book. So <laughs> we'll be right back. All right, Pat, obviously, we're going to pick up the conversation uh, about the book. Um, you know, this is, you know, something I remember fondly when we were going through our COVID pods during 2020, as we had you on a couple of times, and you had not yet published The Accidental Footballer, but we're in the process of, of writing it. And I remember you talking a little bit about the about the part two, like you already had the part two written in your in your mind, but you were kind of polishing the first part. I mean, were those always like in, as you were constructing this thing? Were there always two parts? Are there three parts? Are there four parts to this? Like, what what's what's your series look like when it's all said and done? How does that process work? Well, there is three, um, and it was always going to be three um, because I had the first part of my career and before my career, which was the first book, which rather delightfully sold incredibly well, you know, and the yeah. publishers were stunned by this. The second part was always going to be the second part of my career and because it, it was complicated and there were things that happened with me. This happened to no other footballer ever. You know, you, who has ever been a chief executive and player at the same time at a top level club? It's not, it's just not thinking. <laughs> and there's a reason for that because it's mad, right? <laughs> now I explain why it becomes madder and madder as time goes on. But the third part was actually the part uh, which I, I always wanted to write first, which is post-career. I travelled so much with my media job and I've been all over the world. I've been to all the World Cups, Euros. I mean, I, in the last few months, I've been in Paris, Milan, all over Europe, just covering games. And adventures happen while you're there doing these things. And uh, those stories and those memories are kind of written down as well. And there's some great characters in that. Because right. any story has to have good characters. Um, but the second one, the one that's out just now, I, I'll tell you a wee story about it. Anyone who's listening might quite like this. So I finished the first one. I hadn't told the publishers about the second one, and they were really excited. And it was the day it was coming out. They took me for lunch, and they said, look, everyone said this is great. It's really good if you thought about another one. I went, yeah, here it is. <laughs> just gave them that. <laughs> you had the full draft and everything. Yeah. You were just... went, That's not what writers do. <laughs> Um, but I knew kind of stuff I wanted to do. So that all that side of it's been good. And what's been lovely is, you know, that there are so many things that, you know, if you run a football club, it kind of doesn't matter. It was a top-level football club in Scotland. Okay, that's different from a top-level football club in England, which is different for a, a club at a different level. Yeah. But there are a hell of a lot of similarities, I can tell you. A huge amount. Just put a couple of zeros on the end, usually. <laughs> and... That's why, you know, when I write things, I write them for reasons. Um, I don't write it. It's not to say, hey, how great I am, because I don't always come across as getting everything right, because nobody does. But there has to be a reason to write. And there's lots of reasons why I wrote. Um, I get the joy of it and, you know, the creativity, yeah. But warning to people who, you know, come into this business and say, all right, I know everything. I'll go and just cruise in. And, you know, my my other team, Everton, who I, I still deeply love, have a look what's going on with them just now. And look what happened when Mashiri came in. And they, they spent three quarters of a billion. And in the last two years, they've nearly went down twice. Now, everybody thought the new owner knew everything because it came from business that had done well. You just need to be careful. You know, you come into a club and you, you need to care for it. You need to nurture it. You need to, it kind of handy if you grow to love it as well. It's, you know, yeah. one of the big things about uh, Roman that we all got to understand was he may have come in for a variety of reasons and he may have put that money in there for a variety of reasons. But does anyone at any point doubt that he loved F Chelsea Football Club? No, nah. he absolutely fell in love with it. And that's what kind of the real football fans, they want. They want they want a, a kind of a mirror of love with the ownership and the players and the fans. They all want that mixed up together. Um, you can't always get it, but that's what the fans want. Um, and also they want it to be done sensibly. As you're writing part two or constructing part three already, um, what, what are your favorite sorts of passages to write? Are they, are they more based on the stories and kind of the recall that you have of, of certain moments or is it about stringing a like consistent narrative together? Like just, I, I'm curious about your process more, more than anything, not these specifics. 
it's it's like a gigantic jigsaw, the biggest jigsaw you've ever done in your life. And so you have an idea and a thread. Now I'm very lucky. My process is the thread is the career. So you know chronological a little bit, yeah. Chronological career. But all the stuff that comes off it, which is the stories about the personalities and the people and the reasons why it's all going this direction. And we had the manager at, when I was at Tranmere. And honestly, I could have written a book about him. Just on his own. <laughs> no problem at all. He was that eccentric. And I love the eccentricity. I like eccentricity. I like extreme characters. And there's nothing better for a writer than to be given an extreme character. <laughs> it's brilliant. So you know what the narrative art's going to be. It, it, no book, I think, finishes up the way you started thinking about it. I don't think anyone, and it never should, because you have to allow you, your mind to process it in different ways. So, you know, the writing was fine um, and enjoyable. The biggest part was what to leave out and what to cut, because yeah. most books are 90 or 100,000 words. Again, I had 140,000 words at the end of this. you got to get rid of it a lot. You know, a lot of stories, a lot of, and there was two particular chapters, which I just took out. And I thought they were interesting. And any fans or any journalists I've shown them to, they've thought, why did you take that out? And one of them was very specifically why football associations work badly. Because I was in them. I was, as a chief exec, you become one of them. You become part of every committee. And then you, as an outsider, I'm looking at going, why are you doing these things? They are bizarre. They have, Every fan would think you're mad. So, you know, there was a, a whole chapter on the, the, the madness of that, which I kind of took out and thought, no, that will go somewhere else one day because it didn't help the narrative arc of the story. Um, so you, you've got to take all those things into consideration. Um, but in the end, one of the biggest things you learn about writing books, um, see the stuff that you take out, which breaks your heart to take out, it really hurts, like anyone who's ever read. See if you've written a, a, a story, even at school, if you've written an essay and it's too many words long, you need to take a bit out and you think, oh, I wrote that brilliantly. It hurts, doesn't it? Right? But you always have to remember the reader doesn't know that. It doesn't know what you've taken out. Yeah, they're not reading both versions. or yeah, no, any, exactly. No. And you have to get your head around that. It's for the reader. The reader has to be informed. The reader has to be entertained. So, But the best bits to write are I'll be honest, the humorous bits, which hopefully there's plenty again, um, but also the really quite painfully sad bits as well, the hard bits. Not not shrinking away, just absolutely opening up and saying this is what it felt like. And those were the hardest bits to write, those bits, but they were also in many ways the best bits to write. Were those the memories that kind of hit you the most when you were writing this or was there or was there one other key thing that you're like i kind of buried that a little bit and now it's back and now i'm kind of processing it all over um i'm not very good with the old processing stuff etc i i can just breeze along in life as you could probably tell um but you know I, we'd never spoke spoken my wife and i about our son's autism to anyone and not we weren't hiding it it was just it was up to him when he was of an age he could speak about it or he wouldn't mind speaking about it. So um, it was only by the time the second book, I'm thinking, right, this is the period. So we asked my son, who's now 32, how he felt about it. And, you know, we never knew if he would fully understand. Now, everywhere in the world now, autism's more understood. It wasn't back then. It was really, we were absolutely drowning at sea when we, we found out when he was only two and a half. Um, and we never knew what he'd be capable of. Um, so. Writing about that, I had I could only do it, and it was the most important thing in my entire life at that point, and still. Um, I could only do it with his say so. Um, and Simon, my son, said, Yeah, okay, he's fine. And, and he wasn't even interested, he, he wouldn't read the book, he wouldn't read the book. I mean, he can read very, perfectly well, but he wouldn't be interested in dad. So <laughs> that's, that's what, what I thought. so funny. I just every true. every I mean, every kid with their parents is so good. Well, my, my my son Simon is a fanatical Chelsea fan. He doesn't care that I play for Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> that's just dads, are, and that's the way it should be with dads. 
Um, but I tell you a little story which is absolutely beautiful. You know, Simon's done really quite well in his life, you know, up, upper capabilities of what we ever thought he would get to. But the day the book arrived, um, I hope we can see the green copy in the background somewhere. Uh, the day it arrived, um, I said to my wife, I'll ask, ask Simon if he wants me to read some of it about, about his autism. So I did, and my wife had gone to work, and I said to her, I said to Simon, do you want to read, me to read a bit to you? And I read a wee bit, and he was like, clearly bored. And uh, and I finished, and he went, and I said, do you want to go down and play on the computer? And he went, yeah. I went, fair, on you go. And I thought, well, you know, I, I read it, I tried it, so he's not interested. So I had to go away again that night. And uh, as I was driving away at the game, my wife came home and, and I said, oh, I read a bit of the book to Simon. And she said, he's not shut up about it since. Ah, uh, there it is. Brilliant moment. Of, there it is. Wow. <laughs> you know, so there's all those joyous moments. And if, if there is a big overreaching reason to write the book as well, it's Simon's journey as well. And all of those people who have not just autism, but who have gone through that, you know, th those difficulties, people, people who have got, you know, are, are just dif different in their own way, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people, so many people have got in touch um, in the last number of months just to say it really helped, you know, yeah. that, that everyone goes through. It doesn't matter if you're famous or you're rich or it, it, it doesn't matter. When you get through that, that, that over, it's overarching more important than everything else. Of course, of course. Uh, last question about the book, and I remember asking this last time too, but I'm curious if it changed at all. What advice would you give to anyone who's thinking about starting the writing process, whether it be for a book or short story or anything uh, narrative driven like this? What, what's your piece of advice? Well, I'm sure the last piece of advice was just start. Yeah. we would add another bit. Just start and enjoy it. I would, I would I'd add the enjoy because... See that first chapter, stroke, paragraph, whatever sentence that you that's stuck here, right? That's never going to appear. You're going to change that. <laughs> so, so don't worry about that one. Just move on to it. It's like any creative writing process. It's, it's good to have a decent structure in place to hang it on. But the real joy of writing and the, the absolute joy of writing, and it's not a beginning paid money or you don't, you'll never become a multi-millionaire unless you're JK Rowling. But the real joy of it is seeing you write something and then it sparks something else in your mind and it sparks something else. And you come to the end of the paragraph and you think, that was pretty good. And you think, I never knew I had that inside me. And we've all got that. So if you're listening and you're thinking about it, just try. You don't know what's in there. You think you know what's in there. You don't know what's in there. And it can be great. Amazing. Well, we're going to take our last ad break. And then the the last half of this pod is all about Chelsea and everything that's happening. But uh, we had to get a little bit of insight on the book and uh, make sure that everyone knew what was going on. So thank you to the sponsors. We'll be right back. All right, Pat, uh, we, we have to talk about it. <laughs> uh, we're, we're back in the saddle on some on some Chelsea chat. And look, I think by any reasonable person's uh, analysis. It has been a uh, it's been a bumpy start for for Clear Lake at Chelsea. A ton of reasons for that. Some in their control, many in their control. Some things just simply out of their control and bad luck and bad bounces. If you were to summarize, you know, the first year and a half of their ownership so far, what would that look like? Um, it's almost like a year zero. Uh, because when the club had left Roman Abramovich's ownership, you know, under sanctions, that causes his own problems. People have forgotten the problems that co yep. caused. We lost a lot of players that we'd rather have kept, but that was just the situation. So you find yourself in a really difficult situation there. There were some players brought in, I think, at that point in time, that had to be panic bought just around about that time. And some of them have gone already and they've had fabulous successes. And I remember trying to explain to people that had to be done. We were in a hurry to get numbers in. You needed bodies in. And some of them weren't great. Some of them weren't the standard that we were used to. Since it settled down, and I don't mean in terms of management because that's that's been difficult. Um, since it settled down, 
and I've been able to see what I think the plan is, I've, I've tried to tell everyone, you know, look, don't expect this to happen right away. It, yeah. it shouldn't happen right away. So I've been underlining that to as many people as I possibly can. Um, but it does happen to have to happen eventually. <laughs> That's the point. When you put that amount of money uh, up front, you change everything so much. You change the direction of the club so much. Well, you kind of hope it's going to be a direction that's really successful. I mean, it sounds kind of odd, but I need to, to I always tell Chelsea fans, you know, the ones that I really like. It hurts me as much as it hurts anyone when certain players go away. Mason Mount leaving hurt. But I'll tell you what, in terms of pure finance and accountancy, made sense. There you go. It did. And it hurts me to say it, but there you go. That's it. It particularly hurt me that Kai Havertz left. I was a huge fan of Kai. I never thought he played in the right position. Um, but I thought he just got in there and did as much as he possibly could. You look at what Arsenal are doing with him now. They're playing him, you know, off the striker. And he's got four in his last seven. And he's beginning to look like the player. So it's all those sorts of things. But you have to put them by the by. Um, well, before Clear Lake came in, if you had to look at Chelsea and thought, where are we great? Our wing backs were amazing. They yeah. were, they were unbelievable. When we played well, Reese was flying up the right hand side, then Chelly was up the left hand side, and we were creating also. I don't think Lee Lake have had that. I, I really don't think they've had both of them at the same time for any more than a week or two, it felt, playing at their best. So in the end, it was an, an entire, complete, and utter rebuild. And I'm a wee bit more patient than a lot of people. Um, because I, as I say, I've run a club before and everyone, and fans rightly, want it to happen yesterday. That's when you want it to happen. And I remember me explaining when I was taking over and I was bringing a new manager in, saying to people, this is going to hurt for a while. I'm really sorry, but it's going to hurt for a while. Um, but we will try and build it. And we it didn't take us that long, actually. It took us, within six months, we were third in the league which in Scotland is the best you can do because you can't beat Celtic and Rangers because they're just far, far, far too big, right? Um, but we kind of, I had a number of plans running at the same time. One of them with the youth one, which was going to run alongside this other one, which was going to work, keeping us up where we wanted to be. And the youth one was just there to come up above and take over it. So I kind of saw this double strategy that had to be used. So when I watch what Chelsea are doing just now, it looks more like, wow, the youth strategy is up there and the other strategy is kind of, it's bumping along a wee bit, you know, but I, I get it. I've seen it. I've done it, you know, to some degree, but it's much harder to do in the Premier League yeah. because if you're not at your best in the Premier League, it's a good league. It's a damn brilliant league. And at the moment, Aston Villa is super side, you know, Arsenal are good side, Spurs, no, I'm, a, I'm a, this hurts Chelsea fans, but I'm a huge fan of Ange Postecoglou, and you know have been for years. Um, I can remember very late in my time working at Chelsea, I was saying, "Could we not get him from Celtic?" <laughs> for someone who was whose background I used to be a Celtic fan as a kid, it hurt to take, drag him away from Celtic. But if you watch teams like his team playing, you you'll just enjoy it if you're a fan. So there's lots of good teams around. There's lots of interesting things. There's lots of big money in Manchester City. So it's tough. It's really tough. And if you fall below the very high standards, you fall right down the table. And yeah. that's where we are. You, you've watched a lot of the team this season. Performances have varied, right? I mean, there have been, uh, I wouldn't say great, but very good at times. And they've been very poor at times. It Just... Give a little bit of insight on the good, the bad, and the ugly so far of what you've watched. Well, as we brought the players in, I mean, Enzo can play. He's a player. 100% he's a great player. He's, you know, he's, he's young, but he's going to be a fabulous player. Mudrik has got everything to be a top player. Um, it's not happening all the time just now. We all know that. Um, but he's got all the attributes you need. He's got skill. He's got pace. He's got... It's the vision to work in that league is what you need to add on top of that just now. And just look through it and there's good individual players. It looks like, I kind of said it as a kind of a joke the other day, it looks like a, a team picked by algorithm. He's good there, he's good there, he's good there, he's good there. 
But where's the mix? Um, and the very best managers know how to mix it or get players who will mix with the others. I mean, I've played with fullbacks and I've played wide attack, wide midfield. And I've played with some fullbacks who are really good, but boy, did we have no understanding. And I've played with others who are average, but we had a brilliant understanding. And the ones with the great understanding and the understanding of movement and my weaknesses, my strengths would be offset by their weaknesses and their strengths. Those are the things within football that football people are kind of can see the best football people. That's why you have Hodge. He's to go and try and do that. The one bit that really made me jump up is when we bought Cole Palmer. And uh, I was on record at the time saying, oh my God, we've won a watch. We have suddenly struck gold dust. And everyone was looking at me going, what? He's only played a few times for City. This, as, as I said at the time, and it was so, it's putting a lot of pressure on he could be the new Kevin De Bruyne. Easy. And I don't say that like He is a spectacularly good player. And it staggered me that Manchester City let him go. And I know why part, I've heard a few rumours, but I've heard part of the reason why he's gone, because there's a lot of players of his ilk in front of him, like Foden, etc. Right? And Grealish, etc. But when we got him, I thought, ooh, that system, that, that could tie it together. He was the one for me that if we can find him and get him space and him be, allow him to develop space and make him core to it, you've got a chance. You absolutely have got a chance because there's, there's good players around. You know, there are good players in that team. Um, but you, in a way, he's the one that's, for me, so high enough. And he costs much less than Casado, costs less than Enzo and all that, but it's him. You don't get to the very, very top level unless you've got exceptional creative players and he's the best we've got by a country man. Yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, you, you, you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, this is a position in which you thrived at Chelsea dynamic, tricky, intelligent. Like this is, I thought the mirror might be, might be one that you were excited about. And on the other side, you have Mudrick who is a bit more raw at this point. I think it's fair to say who has, a lot more physical attributes than maybe Cole does, um, who, you know, loves to, to get on the end of something that's been kind of whizzed through. Like what, what, what in your mind is kind of the, the working dynamic between these two very different types of players and like, how do you get them to gel in one attack together eventually? Uh and I, oddly enough, I, I, would, I would not compare them in any way whatsoever. One of them plays attacking right, one of them plays attacking left, sometimes a wee bit more central. But they're, they're so different in terms of skill sets that, that they're not comparable. I mean, I, I look at Cole Palmer and I'm looking at people like David Silva, I'm looking at people like De Bruyne, I'm looking at that sort of player. Mudrick's not, he's more direct, he's, he's not playing all the time with his head up. It's, it's just not the same type of player. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having different types and asking different questions, you know, especially if they're adaptable enough to go and change sides and things like that. That's good. Um, but it kind of hurts some players, it hurts some players when someone like Cole comes in and he's a kid and it all looks so easy. <laughs> and he's so good at every single bit of it. But I wouldn't be comparing him to anyone else in the team. I'm comparing him higher. I'm thinking, no, actually, you can be playing for England. You're good enough to be playing for England. And although it hurts a Scotsman to say it, they are damn good at the moment. <laughs> so, you know, he, he is that special. So don't compare him with anyone else. But you need to try and find a situation where, you know, say Cole's got the ball or finding spaces. See, those other players, they need to see and understand. He'll spot them. So don't even, don't even look. Just go. Assume. Go assume he's going to do he'll, he'll know it. He'll see it. Don't go, right, you know, give me the ball, give me the ball. Don't do that. It's no point. He's got it. He'll see it. He's got staggering, staggering vision. I mean, lots of players have got it, but his is, uh, you know, above that level. I mean, at the, and it, uh, people should underline, I'm not saying he is Kevin De Bruyne. I'm just saying he has got all the capabilities of being that brilliant. So we've we'll won a watch with him, and he's very, very good. We're still, I think everybody knows in January, they're, they're going to be on a few more adaptations again. 
Um, we have to be aware, and this is the thing that does worry every Chelsea fan in the background. I hope we're on top of the financial fair play stuff. That's that's the most important thing yeah. above almost everything else. Um, it feels a far away until it, you know, was, was, was it Mike Tyson? Everyone's got a plan until you get punched <laughs> in the face. Yep. Well, so, <laughs> so it feels like, oh, that's far away. But Everton, what's happened to them recently, it can ha- things happen. So we need to be on top of that. Now, if the one thing I know about Clear Lake and the owners, that's their speciality. They yeah. do accounts, they do investment. That's what they do. So I'm getting a very much hopeful that that's not an area that they're going to let us drop into. Um, but if if we don't drop into that area and we are using what, the money even more wisely come December, I've got great hope that we can you know steady things for the second part of the season. Just to close the point on Mudrik, um, yeah, I wouldn't say it started well his first year at Chelsea, roughly. What does he need to do to cement his place beyond the obvious score goals, get assists, sorts of things? Like positionally, as you're watching him, what are some key things that he could do to substantially adapt? Do you know what would be really good if he stopped to developing understandings with people beside him? Yeah. So if you walk, like, watch Kukurea, whoever's playing behind him or beside him, you do, you're a duo. It's not just you. And Mikhail, he's, he's very direct. He gets the ball, he goes straight. I've nothing, that's great. I love that. You really want that. But sometimes you need people to run off you and you need to use them as decoys. It's, it's not always about you and that person or persons in front of you. It's the people that are around you and working with you. That's the easy, it's an easy thing to say that. It's a hard thing to learn. It's a really hard thing to learn. It's the weirdest thing. Do you know what? Sometimes slow down. <laughs> That's such a weird thing. Just kind of slow down. When it's on to go, use that burning pace. Yeah, use it. But use it intelligently. And that's that's the hardest thing to do when there's a lot of pressure on you, which there is a lot of pressure on him. Expectations are being through the roof. He didn't ask for the transfer fee to be what it was, but because it is what it is, the expectations are that much higher. Yeah. And again, there have been many players, and I have great hopes for Mudrick. Remember, Arsenal wanted him, other teams wanted him. Remember, we did have De Bruyne. We did have Mo Salah. It wasn't working for them. It sometimes takes some players a lot bit longer than others. Uh, I I read, uh, went and reread a lot of your columns from last season in preparation for this. And one uh, particular thing stuck out to me. Uh, you said uh, in one of your columns, I think it was after the draw to Everton, that you would never want to be a first team manager because, and I quote, this might be the main reason why I've never fancied being a manager. The feeling you have done everything possible. The team has played well. The positive narrative is already written online about the performance. The copy for the next day's newspapers is ready to go out about how well you played and highlight shows that you know, are preparing to gush about your continuing revival, all that sort of stuff. Then in the dying seconds, that final breakaway radically changes the way your entire day is viewed by everyone. It must be crushing to see an entire week's work flipped on its head like that. I find it difficult enough to cope as a fan. As a manager, it must be desperately disappointing. Uh, one, your writing is beautiful per usual, but I mean, talk to me about that because this has been not just Pochettino, it's been Potter, you know, Tuchel. It's, it's gone back a little bit now that there's been these sorts of like heartbreaking moments at the end of games and, and such. Yeah, there's been a real run of it. It really has. Um... And times when we've had 70, 75% possession, all the chances, and it never seems to go in. And that's why everyone keeps on going back to the, we need a centre forward, a goal scorer. I wish it was that simple. That's part of it, but it's not that simple. But it becomes almost a narrative within the, the group's mind. We think, oh, we're never going to score here. You know, and something, when you're scoring freely, you don't even think about it. You just run in there and put it in the net. Even if it's bouncing and zipping across. When it's not going your way, everyone's trying to be dead careful and, you know, take an extra touch, which is the worst thing you can do, and make sure, which you, can, you haven't got time to do that in the Premier League. 
But the torture, as a player, it's bad when you work really, really hard and you've done everything you could. But, you know, you're out there, the physicality of it, you've gone through it and you know you'll work at it again next week. As a manager, you can't actually do anything to change it other than a couple of substitutions or a couple of re-tactical changes. The, the, the struggle I've watched some guys who I know are very good managers. I mean, we've had a few that have... I know they're good coaches. I mean, Potter's a good coach. He's a very, very good coach. There's no doubt about it. He is. Because um, he did great jobs elsewhere. And you watch Potts struggling a little bit to get this running. But he's a good coach. There's a reason why he was at some of the top clubs and they all wanted him. He's a good coach. You've got to be a lucky one as well. Um, and things have to fall into place. And that's when I was the chief exec. I could have made myself manager if I wanted that option. I just thought, no, I, I, you need to have a certain personality that can take that torture where you've put everything into every player. And then at the end of it, you get a punch in the solar plexus, which is completely, and it feels totally and utterly unfair. And then you have to walk back at the end of it and react in a way that helps everybody. You know, because we're all angry at that point in time. We're, who walks out cheery after a late equaliser, a late losing goal? And by the way, this season's been more extreme in that than any season I've ever known, ever in the Premier League. It's just extraordinary, the late goals. But trying to, A, be composed, fair enough, but B, find out the right way to react and behave and change from that. You, sometimes it's, A, you've got to be a genius, but B, sometimes there is no right way. And I've watched Pep sometimes, supposedly the best in the business just now, get it completely wrong. <laughs> so it's a tough, tough gig. Um, so no, I never particularly wanted to be a manager. You have to have a certain skill set to do it. Of It's not the technical side, it's the personality side. Um, so I'm very rarely one who has a dig at managers because I know firsthand being on both sides of it, it is an incredibly hard job. I mean, what do you make of the job that Potch has done so far? I mean, we're we're four months into the season, roughly. Um, what are his biggest achievements and what are his biggest challenges that are remaining? It's, it's again, I have to say it, I sound like a broken record. Um, it's too early to tell. You can tell. Um, one of the most difficult things in the modern game is um, you look at the team, the group, and I've got friends who are managers at a top level just now, and you think, how many of them did you choose? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, I don't really know. And we don't know. And they don't tell you. And they can't tell you. Um, and there might, there might be players coming in that they didn't want. They thought they were the wrong one. So I'm always a wee bit aware of that. That, you know, if, and I, I think a lot of managers, and certainly I know Thomas Tuchel was like this. He didn't want to choose the players all the time. He very much the opposite of that. Get me the players and I'll make the best out of them. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Poch, to some degree, is like that as well. Um, but in the end, whatever you do, you've taken control of the club. So it's your head. Your head's in the chalk block. And you need to get the best at those players. And the one thing I, I absolutely would say in this, there's enough talented players in that group to be at least top half of the table. And in two years' time, it hopefully is at least European level of football. Um but whether it was, I suspect Poch will have looked at it now for the months that he's been in and he's watching this, this next transfer in the window, over an interview and is thinking to himself, right, I know what's needed. I know what's needed to link this. I know what the, the final bits of the jigsaw is. Because if he doesn't know what the final bits of the jigsaw is, you're not the right man for the job. Okay, you aren't. And, that, and that's not Posh, that's any manager, right? This is his first chance to say, right, this is the bit of the jigsaw. Don't need that bit, I don't need that bit, and I don't need that bit, but I need, I need this. I think he might try and add some of it in December or January. Probably not all of it, because not everything's available in January. But by the start of next season, I think you can then start judging Pochettino as a real manager. Between now, you know, between the start and the end of this season, I think it's harsh enough to do anything other than say he's building a lot of young players who have not got a huge amount of experience in the Premier League, trying to make them into a team that's competitive. 
and I think that's tough. You wrote multiple times uh, over the years, I think dating back to the Lampard days, the kids are all right. This, exactly. This, I mean, this team is like more kids than any team that we've had for, for some time. They're, I think, average age of, what, 24 um, or roughly there, thereabouts. What are your what are your thoughts on this? I mean, this is obviously a young core of, of talent. You know, I think Connor Gallagher at, at twenty four is is one of the old heads in the group now. It's, it's just, you know, it's with youth comes an experience, I suppose. Yeah, it does, and you know they 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 feel some pressure when it's not going well because the expectation is incredibly high. I can remember I was a, I think I was about twenty five when I moved to Everton, and that was a team that won leagues, won European trophies. And it was just the expectation levels changes everything. It, it does change everything. You have to see yourself and the group in a different way. So being a pretty good Premier League team is not good enough anymore. So you need to raise your game. Problem is everyone else and every other team's raising their game as well. It's easy to say. It's really hard to do. Um, there are some players you look at and think, yeah, Enzo, yeah, he's fine. He's good. He's, he's a top quality player. We know Cole as I've gone on about him and look around the team and there are really good players there. Um, but they've all got steps to make. The rest of them have got steps to make. I, I can almost let the the centre-backs off, the younger centre-backs. It takes longer for centre-backs. It's just sadly the way of the world. You know, you they can have a brilliant game, make one mistake and they'll get one out of ten. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it works with centre-backs. So... Some of the younger ones we've got in there, it would take a little while for them. Um, but, you know, you would rather have them in there. So, Colville, I mean, honestly, you'd be fabulous. Don't worry about him. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so we have got good players through that. But it still remains to be seen, if we're going to be brutally honest. They're making steps, but will they make those steps up to that level that they need to be to be what we think of as Chelsea, yeah. which is a team battling at the top of the Champions League. I cannot give you the answer to that just now because I don't know the answer. I don't think anyone does. Mystery abounds, Pat. Mystery abounds. I'm looking forward to it, by the way. It'll be exciting. A lot of, it's not, there's been a lot of dull games just now. But Chelsea's always entertaining. Chelsea's always exciting. You know, we've got that. And as long as we keep that spirit within the group, particularly fans that are getting to the games as well, you know, when we need to keep don't lose that because I'm going to a lot of games around for, uh, just now. If you go to Everton, it's, it's a wall of emotion. If you go to Spurs, I have to tell you, it's an incredible place at the moment, particularly the size of that stadium. But the noise there is unbelievable. Villa is off the scale. But then you go to places at Man United or even Manchester City. And I have to tell you, it's not great. It you know, really isn't. And if you, if you, we are going to do this as Chelsea, we need that that Chelsea support that we've always had to help those players. Because I can promise you, as a player, boy, that helps. So if I had any yeah. plea or any call to any Chelsea people at the moment, it's difficult times, but you need to stick by a team. Uh, speaking of a spark plug and potentially someone to get you off your feet, uh, we, we are we're talking on Monday, December 18th, but at some point over the next two or three weeks, Nkunku will kind of resume activities with the team and, and potentially get some of his first minutes at the club. This has to be one of those like big moments of the season, right, Pat? I mean, this is a guy who's a bona fide goal scorer who uh, won the golden boot in, in the Bundesliga last year, who came in with all of these expectations and had an unfortunate injury, which is an, an unfortunate narrative that we have also seen before. What are your uh, what are your thoughts on the return of Nkunku and the sort of impact it could have potentially on this team? Um, I hope he has a very good one. Um, but I've I've watched him quite a bit beforehand. He's not an out and out centre forward striker. That's right. not his position. Um, he can play that position, but then lots of players can. Um, but that number of goals, if we can remember, Timo Werner came in with staggering amounts of goals. And although we love Timo because of his work rate, the goals didn't come quite to the same level. The Premier League's hard. It's harder than the Bundesliga. That's it. Simple, simple truth. That is the case. We know Kai Havertz didn't score as many in the Premier League as he did in the Bundesliga. So 
try to drag the expectations down a wee bit. Everything's not sorted because he walks in the door. Right. Uh, and it won't be sorted right away when he walks in the door or walks onto the pitch. Um, I hope he has a good start. If he scores a couple early, he could go on a run. It'd be fantastic. But I would take, kind of try and draw expect down, expectations down just a little bit. Um, it may well be into next season for you. You'll understand him as a player and see him as a player and where he fits in within this group. Um, that's going to be you know, a tough one. Because at the moment, a couple of times we've, you've pushed Enzo a little bit further forward, behind the centre forward. And you've got obviously Midrick or whatever, and Copam on one side. And Kunku might be the man playing at the head of it. I'm not sure it's always going to be right for him to do that. We'll have to see. That's, that's a tough gig that you have to remember. Look at all the centre forwards Chelsea have had over the years. We have got, we have had some of the best strikers in the world of Kimmers. And it's not necessarily worked as well as we hoped. So, Keep the expectations within reason. He'll help the team, certainly pacey. He can score goals, um, but don't expect him to be Harry Kane. <laughs> it's, right. it's, not that. it's just not that. Um, but if you've got him coming back, Roger's nearly fully fit yet now, um, and there is a possibility that another striker might be sought after during uh, January, that's probably the more realistic way to look at it. Uh, a couple more here. Uh, Connor Gallagher situation is uh, kind of resumed uh, in in the narrative in the media. Um, you know, does not have a new contract. Is coming up on the last year of his deal. Has been integral to everything that Chelsea and Maurizio Pochettino have wanted to do with the team this year. Uh, you mentioned Mason Mount earlier this year or earlier this podcast um, and his departure earlier in the summer. Are there any parallels to draw here? Is this simply a financial exercise that the club have undertaken, or is there a long-term future for Gallagher at Chelsea? Well, I would love him to stay, full stop. Yeah, same. I, I'd be one of the first picks in the team sheet. Um, it would be great if he scored a few more goals, but, you know, you, for, for energy levels and picking up people around you, fabulous. You want, in, in the modern game, he's exactly what you want. And if he wasn't playing at Chelsea, trust me, Spurs would be chasing him all over the place to get him, as would Man United, as would others, right? So we know that that's the case. Um, if Connor doesn't sign a new contract and they can't get an agreement, they need to let him go. You, can, you can't lose the money. It's just, we, the club will not be in a position with financial fair play to allow that. Uh, what would be sad is if he was sold when he really wanted to stay and it, he could have stayed, but because of the, the, the way that the new rules work, that's kind of free money you get from that because he's through the system. If, because we feel that's, many of us feel that may be part of the reason why. Um, in fact, that's the reason why Cole Palmer, one of the reasons why Cole Palmer left Manchester City. We have to remember that we benefit from this, this weird system as well as suffer from it with, you know, with others, with Mason Mount leaving. Um, but from my point of view, purely the football person and somebody who wants Chelsea to do their best, I think it'd be a gigantic miss for us. And also there's that thing about, you know, one of us, you know, coming through, mm -hmm. being there for a long time. You, you, want a, you want an ethos at a club, an ethic that comes from something deep that you can hang on to that's not just, you know, vague, we'll just, go and get everybody from around the world and we don't have a central thing. Fans love it when they've got their own. And our academy has developed so many phenomenal players over the years and it just hurts when there's not one or two in the, in the team at a time. And uh, I'd love to see them stay. But if the set, a new contract isn't signed, then sadly, you, you can't let them run down. You can't let a player run down a contract to nothing. That doesn't make sense. Final two questions, and they're kind of speed rounds. Um, you can build this young Chelsea team around one player for the next three seasons. Who are you picking out of this group and why? has to be Cole Palmer. Um, it could have been Enzo to some degree. I think those two are the ones that I would jump at just now. I would hope it would be Connor as well, but for pure quality, those two are have got spectacular distances they could go. Um, if you're players of that quality and that vision, because I look for vision all the time, 
energy levels, willingness to do it for the team. Um, I, I think we'll struggle to get much better than them too. Cole Palmer, don't let anything happen to him. Perfect. All right, and then last one. Uh, I know we are a few places off of this right now, but if Chelsea are to challenge for the European places second half of the season, which you know we can debate all, all the time, it's because this player put the team on his back and went on a run of form. Um, that's a very good thing. Actually, I think we'll, we'll score enough goals. I think we'll, after January, I think we'll score enough goals. So it's all about making sure the back line's right. Um, Thiago Silva's just spectacular, you know, and whether he's actually doing it on the pitch or being helpful to every one of those young centre-backs that are coming in, I think he's going to have a massive, massive effect on the team. Don't lose what he can give us, you know, uh, between now and the end of this season, whatever the situation. I know he's not young, but he has got so much experience and understanding. And I watch some of our defenders learning little bits off of him. Yeah. Whatever, even if he's only here until the end of the season, get every bit of information out of that man that you possibly can. He is extra special. I think I would have put Caicedo in there, personally, because I think that role is going to just be pivotal for all the uh, attacking play that moves forward, and he's kind of, I think, finding his way a little bit right now, too. But could look. be. There's, there's, yeah, there's lots of players you could actually put in there as the real possibilities, but you'll notice we're, we're generally talking about central, the core. You need to get the core right. Um, so that's why I talk about centre-backs. Get the core right, and you'll probably be okay. Well, Pat, this is wonderful catching up with you. I think everyone's going to love this episode. Uh, let's talk about where people can find the book um, and and how uh, they can see you do your thing on uh, on match days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, hey, I can get it on Amazon and all that sort of stuff, all the usual places and all the good bookshops. Uh, in, in several terms, it's, it's been lovely to, to actually have a couple of books out now and people have enjoyed them. And that, that's all you do it for. You do it for the pure joy of that. So if you don't get it for this Christmas, don't worry. You can get it for next Christmas. It won't go out of date. Uh, where are people going to find you over the, the festive period? Which matches are you doing? Uh, so I've got my next ones. I've got Newcastle. Um, as I say, I've got Celtic Rangers coming up, which could be a cracker. Um, Sunderland Newcastle Cup is another oh. one. But the way my job is, um, quite often with the BBC, I'll get a call two days before. Can you get to wherever? Um, yeah. And that's that's the way my kind of life works. And I kind of love it. You know, it's, I, it's one of these things, the joy of, I mean, I had the best job in the world playing football, and particularly playing football for Chelsea. But now I've got one where they pay me to, not a huge amount, it's the BBC after all, but they pay me to go and watch football games. Um, and just before I talked to you on air there, I was talking to the BBC who were telling me which games I'll be getting, doing for the European Championships come uh, June and July. And it was just this moment of, you know, my friends are all trying to save up to go and see Scotland play and get over there and find ways of getting there and getting hotels. So uh, you, you never hear a moment's worth of complaint off of me. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you again for joining the show. Hopefully we're going to talk to you soon because it's been a, a delight. As ever. Me too. And to all the... Fans listening there, uh, stick with the team. Keep your blue flag flying. You said it just as well as I could have. Uh, that'll wrap us, Chelsea fans. Of course, you know where to find us. Uh, keep the blue flag flying high. <laughs>